week and a half ago or so, I was part of uh, a conference that happened in Kinshasa in the Congo with uh, Dr. Foley Lagunda. I was teleconferenced in with uh, someone else here in the States and someone in South Africa and uh, someone in Paris. And um, I looked on the internet while well, we, we had some time to kill uh, under the State Department uh, website and they have, they issue travel advisories. And so I wanted to just sort of imagine if I had gone to Kinshasa for this. And it says this right at the beginning, reconsider travel to the Democratic Republic of the Congo due to crime and civil unrest. Some areas have increased risk. Uh, do not travel to, and then they give a couple of places due to crime, Ebola and kidnapping and another place due to armed conflict. Violent crimes such as armed robbery, armed home invasion, and assault, while rare compared to petty crime, is not uncommon. And local police lack the resources to respond effectively to serious crime. Beware that assailants may, may pose as police or security agents. And I thought, wow, that sounds like a dangerous place and well it might be. Uh, then I looked at some other places uh, where other countries talked about coming to our country and they give travel advisories for coming to the States as well. And it occurred to me that your home is a place that you know and are a citizen of and you know the places to go and the places not to go. Uh, I recall uh, being a little nervous about going to Israel the first time because I had spent uh, almost a year in the Middle East prior to that and come to find out that I actually I feel safer when I'm there than I do in certain parts of some cities in this country. Uh, and so it's all about what your perception of home is and where you are a citizen of. But being in a different place can mean a lot. It does mean a lot. And so as citizens of heaven, we are in a foreign place on this earth, in this cosmos, this world system. We may look the same, but we really don't blend. And why is that? Because we see the world differently than the world sees itself. And so the question comes out of that to us, how comfortable are you in this cosmos system? You pretty comfy? Eh, maybe sometimes a little too comfortable. I make myself nervous with my level of comfort in this place. Well, we are coming to a place in this uh, letter that we've been studying. We're at chapter three, which is midway through the book. And we've taken some time to carefully piece our way through the first two chapters. And now we're going to step up the pace because we have some momentum. We've been listening to Paul and we've been tracking with him. And so we've got a feel for what he's talking about. Uh, now our, our call to worship, which has been the same the whole time we've been uh, in this book, comes from uh, the second chapter of Philippians. Have this attitude in you, which is in Christ Jesus, and that whole progression there. And as I said before, all the other pieces of the book are built around that centerpiece. And so this one is as well. And so last week we saw how two of Paul's protégés, Timothy and Epaphroditus, uh, had that attitude in them. And now we see that Paul uh, how that, that attitude works out in his life as well. And so he begins his, this third chapter with this first verse, Finally, my brothers and sisters, rejoice or have joy in the Lord. To keep writing the same things, in other words, I'm going to keep coming back to this, these same topics, to keep writing the same things to you is not troublesome to me, but for you it is a safeguard. And so Paul continues to describe how we can stay on this path to joy. 
we can stay on this path to joy by having that same attitude. And he's going to come back to that central passage in this third chapter. And so he's going to talk about what it means to have live life as a citizen of heaven. And what does it mean to have uh, to be a citizen of heaven? It means uh, three things that he's going to point out to us. The first is that we have new values. Um, and that I'm going to read verses uh, 2 through 11 here, so if you can follow along. And I'm reading in the uh, Tree of Life version, which catches some of the, uh, the Jewish flavor of Paul's uh, ethnic background. Beware, he says, I'm at verse 2, beware of the dogs. Beware of the evil workers. Beware of the mutilation. Well, now, what is he talking about? This sounds kind of harsh. Um, he's talking about some Jewish followers of Jesus who are coming in to their meeting place. These are mostly Gentiles, remember. They didn't even have a synagogue, synagogue in this large city of Philippi. And they are telling them that they need to become converted uh, to Judaism before they can follow Jesus. But the church in Jerusalem has already said, for Gentiles, you don't have to do that. You come as you are to Jesus. But some people were just so wrapped up in uh, the pride of their life and, and what they were that they said, you have to be like us and then you can follow Jesus. Uh, Paul talks about this in the, the letter that he wrote to the Galatians much earlier than this. And he's really tough on these people, these guys. He says, I only wish, this is Galatians 5.12, I only wish those who are agitating you would mutilate themselves. Oy. And he's talking, obviously, about circumcision. So uh, this is a tough Paul is very, very pointed here about what these people are doing. And then he goes on. I'm back in verse 3 now in our chapter. For it is we who are the circumcision, who worship by the Holy Spirit and glory in Messiah Jesus and have not depended on the flesh. Now, let me give you another comparison, another balancing place for Paul here and what his view of circumcision is. He's not saying that circumcision is a bad thing. In fact, his two main guys that he was training up to follow him were Timothy and Titus. Timothy was half Jewish and Titus was not Jewish at all. He had Timothy circumcised before he took him into ministry with him. And the reason being is that if you want to be do ministry, if you want to share about the Jewish Messiah with the Jewish people as a Jewish person, you need to acknowledge being in their tribe and their ethnicity and their nation. And that is true to this day as well for Jewish followers of Jesus who want to have a testimony back to their own people. They participate in all, they are, they're not saved by being under the law, but they certainly participate in that milieu. And so um, that informs what Paul is saying here, the fact that he did that. And he says, it is we who are the circumcision. That is, those of us who are in Messiah Jesus, who are, who are honoring the king, um, whether we are Jewish or whether we are not Jewish, we are uh, the children of God who worship by the Holy Spirit and who glory in the Messiah, Jesus, and have not depended on the flesh, though I myself might have confidence in the flesh also, if anyone else thinks he might depend on the flesh, I far more. He's saying, if they're showing you their Jewish credentials, they got nothing compared to me. That's what he's saying. I was circumcised on the eighth day, just like all of the rest of them. I was of the nation of Israel, from the tribe of Benjamin, uh, which was right next to geographically bordered with Judah. And the border between Benjamin and Judah went right through the city of Jerusalem. And the first king of Israel was from the tribe of Benjamin. 
His name was Saul, which was Paul's birth name. Uh, Paul, he went by Paul, his Roman name, that got him access into more places. So I was from the tribe of Benjamin, he says, a Hebrew of Hebrews. In regard to the law or the Torah, I was a Pharisee, which is also the same uh, milieu that Jesus was in. The Pharisees believed that the Bible was the word of God. They believed in angels and in heaven and an afterlife. And so Paul was part of that and so was Jesus. Uh, he says, and as and this is verse 6, as for zeal, I persecuted Messiah's community or the church. And as for the law, uh, as for Torah righteousness or keeping the law, I was found blameless. And then he says, but whatever things were gained to me, these I have considered as a loss for the sake of Christ, Messiah, the King. Now, if you think here that he's saying Jewish stuff is bad stuff, that's not at all what he's saying. Let me read you another perspective he gives us in the book of Romans. Romans chapter 9, verses 4 and 5. Uh, and he asks the question just prior to this, is there any advantage to being Jewish? And he says, of course, in every way. Uh, to them belong the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the temple service and the promises. All that stuff came through God's people, Israel. And to them belong the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And this this covenant of circumcision was a covenant with Abraham. He was the first one. And God said, if all your sons will be circumcised from now and forevermore. And to them belong the patriarchs, and from the patriarchs, according to the flesh, that is, the, the sons and daughters of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, comes the Messiah, Jesus, who is over all, who is God, and who is blessed forever, Amen. So he's saying that to have all these things is a great privilege. It doesn't bring you closer to God. It doesn't save you. But in fact, it makes you more liable because you should know. It makes you more responsible. Jesus said, to whom much is given, much is required. It's like as a parent. If you have a child... Um, who grew up and grows up in your house and they bring home or they come home and say, well, I want to do this because so-and-so, the wild hooligan down the street is doing it. You say, I don't care what they do. You will do what's right because you live in my house and you are my child, you see. And that is the relationship. Uh, so, so being Jewish has brought them more responsibility but it has not brought them any closer to God unless they connect through the Messiah. So that is Paul from Romans. Now let me go back to our text. Verse 8, he, say, he said up in verse 7, I've considered these things a loss for the sake of Messiah. More than that, I consider all things to be a loss. Whatever I'm good at, whatever I got, all things are a loss in comparison to the surpassing value of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. Because of him, I have suffered the loss of all things. Whatever I had going for me in this life, whatever I thought I needed, I wanted, my goal, my destiny, he says, that's all gone. And I consider them garbage. I consider them street filth, stuff you don't want to step in, in order that I might gain Messiah, the anointed one, Christ, and be found in him, not having my righteousness derived from keeping the law, but a righteousness that is through trusting, and you can expand that here, we're in a royal context, he's talking about Messiah, the anointed king, uh, but a righteousness that is found through loyalty even to the righteous king, the righteousness from God based on trust based on loyalty. My aim is to know him 
and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, if somehow I might arrive at the resurrection from among the dead. And so that's the picture of this Lord's Supper that we have shared today. Sharing in his sufferings and his death and his resurrection. So where is our pride of self? Our pride of the flesh? I'm smarter, I'm cuter, I'm more athletic, I'm whatever it is that kind of, yeah, this is me. Paul says, I took all that stuff and I put it away from me. Whatever I got, it doesn't mean I'm not that, I mean, it doesn't mean I don't have those things. It means they don't increase my value as a person with God. And I get that. Whatever it is that we're fle- or proud of in the flesh, that is the thing that we have to set aside in order to gain Christ. Even if it's uh, our pride in our church. Paul was proud of being uh, uh, of his, his standing in the nation of Israel. And he says, it doesn't mean a thing with God. If you were born into a Christian family, what would God say to you? If you said, well, you should, you should let me into heaven because I was born into a Christian family. I was baptized. I was confirmed. I was this. I was that. And he might say to you, so what did you do with all that? Did you take that and get to know me? Because you had it all in your hands. You had a privilege. You had a liability. That is a responsibility to come to me. He will be much more forgiving for someone who, who just heard on the periphery about this. There are people in this life, guys that get out of prison, who met the Lord in prison, and they're going to spend the rest of their life trying to get halfway up the social scale where we are. And you know what? In, in God's economy, you get points for effort. They might have to work ten times as hard to get where we were when we were very young, and now we're beyond that. And they will have great credit in the kingdom of heaven. You see. It's a value thing. The disciples came to Jesus and they said, after he'd sent them out on their first kind of mission trip, they said, we cast out demons in your name. And Jesus said, that's really great but I want you to be really happy and glad about the fact that your name is written in the book of life. That's what you ought to be really jazzed about, that you know me, that you're connected to me. That's the only thing that really matters. That's the primary value. And so we have to do like the Messiah did. We have to humble ourselves. I don't live on, we don't live on our pride. We can't do that. We have to humble ourselves and be the person he has called us to be so that he will raise us up. We have to trust that he will raise us up and exalt us as Jesus humbled himself and was exalted to the highest heavens. So, travel advisory for all of us foreigners who are in Christ but living in this place Um, we had a day of Thanksgiving and we were thankful and we ate a lot. And then the world system kind of takes that and it makes this thing called the next day, Black Friday, a day of greed and avarice. Oh, they got such good deals. And I got, I got enough money to buy some stuff. We go do it. The world will take you on its value system. It will, it will plant its values. It will make its values very attractive to us. Travel advisory. So we, as a citizen of heaven, we take on new values. Uh, and then Paul says we take on new goals. Let's look at the next section of this chapter, uh, starting at verse 12. He says of, of this 
arriving at the resurrection and all of that. He says, not that I have already obtained this or been perfected, but I press on. If only I might take hold of that for which Messiah Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself as having taken hold of this. But this one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining forward to what is ahead, I press on toward the goal for the reward of the upward calling of God in Messiah Jesus. He's going for it. Therefore, let all who are mature have this attitude. Remember, he was talking about attitudes. That's in that center passage. And so he's, he's bringing us back to that, central, that centerpiece. Have this attitude. And if you have a different attitude in anything, this also God will reveal to you. Nevertheless, let us live up to the same standard we have attained. And that standard is that Jesus himself did not consider the privileges of heaven something to hang on to. He let go of it. He took his God's godliness, God's self, and put it into the form of a slave. And God exalted him, raised him up, and he, he, he took into that form all the way unto death, even death on the cross, and God raised him up and raised him to the highest heavens. So we are never finished serving the Lord. There's something in our culture, our, our mind, that we, we like to retire. And many of us are retired from the work that we did for a living, and that's great. But we never get to retire from serving our king. If he's your king now, he's your king for the rest of your life. He's where your loyalties lie. We have this thing in our mind, this culture. This is our travel advisory uh, for our goals. Now I can do what I want to do. Nope. If you're serving the king, you serve the king. From now and forever. We find our satisfaction, just like that Psalm 23 the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He takes me and comforts me and gives me what I need. We find our satisfaction, our quietness, our joy. We find our peace in him from now and forevermore. Even when we're retired from our work, we're not retired from serving him. The cosmos has a plan for you. That's the travel advisory here. It's got a plan about you, and it's tempting you. It's tempting me. You can just, you did enough. You can back off now. The Lord says, keep going. Paul says, I'm straining forward. I'm running, I'm sprinting all the way through the tape. That's what we're called to. That's the goal. So we got new values, we got new goals as a citizen of heaven. And he says, finally, we, we get new bodies. That's a good deal. We, some of us could really use that. Let's continue on at verse 17. Brothers and sisters, join in following my example and notice those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. The pattern is the pattern I keep talking about. It's the one we used as our call to worship. For many who walk, or many walk, who are enemies of the cross of Christ, of Messiah, I have told, I have often told you about them, and now I am even weeping as I tell you. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and their glory is in their shame. They set their minds on earthly things. Folks, we live in a country that is a wash in our own success and the church is part of that and and I'm not drawing the lines I'm saying we all have to be aware of this 
that in our culture and society, um, Christian things, Christian people, is a multi-billion dollar market. That's how we're viewed. And we have to make sure that we're staying true and that we're keeping faith with our Lord and King. That is, that's a difficult bit. And Paul is, is grieved by this. And he's talking about people who are claiming to follow Jesus, but in fact are in it for their own good. Let's finish this chapter up here. Verse 20. And the reason I tell you all this, he says, for our citizenship is in heaven. And from there, we eagerly wait for the Savior and the Lord Jesus, the Messiah. So he's saying, we're, we're citizens of heaven, and in a sense, we are abiding there already. We are connected with the, the heavenly places. When we take this table together, we are, we are coming up to the edge of heaven. We are communing with the king of heaven. That's what he wants. And so we wait for our Lord uh, to come. And he says in verse 21 finally, he will transform this humble body of ours. Now this is just a little miniature uh, version of that, that hymn at chapter 2, verse uh, Five through eleven, he will transform this humble body of ours into the likeness of his glorious body. That's just the opposite of what Jesus did. He let go of his heavenly realm and came into one of our bodies, and then was resurrected into uh, this body that we're going to take on one day. We're not going to be resuscitated. We are going to be resurrected. Um, Lazarus in John 12 was resuscitated. He was, life was brought back to his same body. Uh, the word resurrection in, in Greek, it's, it's two words jammed together. It's Anastasia, you know this name. Uh, they, it's a name in Russian. Uh, stasi, uh, stasis, we get the English word stasis. Stasis means that level, flat, stable place. It's the platform. It's the foundation. Ana means to go up. So we have this foundation of the law. We have the foundation of creation, of God himself. And then Christ brings us up above that. Uh, he starts from there and he raises us up from that. So we have these bodies that were created that we live in. And he's going to take us much higher than that. We are going to have... Uh, a glorious, uh, a body that is like his glorious body. He will transform this humble body of ours into the likeness of his glorious body through the power that enables him to put all things in subjection to himself. Just like in chapter 2. Every knee, whether in heaven, on the earth, or under the earth, will bow to the name of the Lord Jesus. That's who we're connected with. And that's the pattern we're following. So, as we, we talked about last week, our difficulties in life, they can be meaningless. You know, some people just say, well, life is a tough deal and then you die. There's a truth to that. Paul is saying, if you are serving the king... There is meaning given to the difficulties in your life. You are suffering on behalf of your Lord. And it has meaning now. And so, uh, you are suffering for him, him, him. I am suffering for him if I am serving him. Those things will end in death if the Lord doesn't come before we die. And then exaltation. So your passport as a citizen of heaven is your soul that is sealed by the Holy Spirit that he mentioned in this passage. 
travel advisory. The longer you walk with the king and the longer you serve the king, the stranger this world will seem. We are foreigners in this place, says the Lord. We are citizens of that place where he is. And so let's take that frame as we we go into this Advent season. It occurred to me that this call to worship we've been saying, I hadn't really planned that as a Christmas message, but it's exactly what it is. He came and he took on flesh uh, like one of us as a baby. And that means something. Uh, that's, that's our example. Humble yourself and God will raise you up. Let's pray.